Okay, so I'm gonna start by reviewing a little bit what we discussed last time. So one of the uh, crucial aspects um, that led us to discuss a two-dimensional reformulation of four-dimensional uh, scattering processes is this isomorphism between the proper autoconus Lorentz group, iso plus one comma three, and um, the 2D uh, global conformal group, SL2C modded by Z2. And so uh, on the left, we are discussing uh, four-dimensional Lorentz transformations, which uh, previously in the previous lecture uh, denoted by this uh, real four by four matrix lambda. And on the right, we uh, have two-dimensional conformal transformation, which are denoted by this complex two by two matrix. And just as an example, um, if you take rotations by an angle theta around uh, x3 coordinate, um, denoted here by uh, the four by four matrix lambda, this can also be represented um, by this complex two by two matrix um, via the uh, embedding of this two by two matrix uh, that I've sort of outlined in the previous lecture and it's also explicitly written in the lecture notes. Okay, so here on the left in the four dimensional um, Lorentz transformations, we have as our generators, uh, the three boosts and rotations, Ki, Gi. And on the right, in the conformal group, we discussed last time, we have uh, translations, dilatations, rotations, and conformal, special conformal transformations. And we're in two dimensions for the purpose of this lecture. And now, because of this isomorphism, there is a way to embed, uh, let's say, the 2D uh, global conformal generators into the four-dimensional Lorentz generators. And furthermore, uh, we can also regroup these generators into uh, generators uh, that make the global conformal structure more manifest. So L0, L1, and L minus one, and then also the BART versions. And then for these, um, this has satisfy the SL2C sub algebra of the Verzor algebra, or here rather the width algebra, because with the methods that we're discussing uh, here, we cannot uh, yet determine a central extension in this two dimensional CFT that's uh, dual to uh, flat space. So I'm just gonna write um, this part here, okay. Um, and so this is a useful way because we can then also embed these uh, global conformal generators into the Vera Soro uh, algebra or the extension of Lorentz transformations into super uh, rotations. Okay, so uh, then we also discussed wave functions and operators last time, but before uh, reviewing that, I wanna spend a little more time uh, with uh, the two-dimensional uh, global conformal group um, because it will be useful to uh, know a bit about the structure of uh, conformal multiplets for um, the rest of this uh, lecture. Okay, so let's start with a primary state, which I will denote by H and H bar, um, which being primary means that it's annihilated by L1 or uh, L bar one. And then from that I can form descendants by acting with L minus one and L bar minus one an arbitrary number of times. And then I get descendants which are also primary, so primary descendants. If these primary, uh, if these descendants are also um, annihilated by L1 and L bar minus one. Okay, so um, let's say we start with uh, this state here um, and ask when is this state, uh, which is a descendant, when is it also a primary? So the, the question is, when does L1 annihilate the state? 
And I can write down uh, what this action is by um, using, um, making use of um, commutator relation between L1 and L minus 1 to the k. So this is given by k times L minus 1 to the k minus 1 and 2L0 plus k minus 1. And you can explicitly check this by setting k equals 2, for example. It's an easy exercise. So yeah, let me give this as an exercise to the students. OK, so then plugging this in, this means that the action of L1 on this descendants is as follows. We have used the fact that L0 on the state uh, gives uh, the conformal weight h. And then so if that is to be 0, then this gives us the condition that h right off from here has to be 1 minus k over 2, and k is a positive number. OK? So, so Andrei, so these are not uh, unitary representations of, of the conformal group? Uh, here I'm just doing 2D uh, conformal field theory. Yes, yeah, so, right so usually now. H is considered, in, in, in the case of highest weight representation, H is considered to be a real uh, positive, uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, right, a real positive number. And in this case, well, if, if K is greater than 1, uh, this, uh, this H is going to be negative. So, so that tells you that the, the norm of some of these states is, is going to be negative, right? So actually, the norm of these conformal primary wave functions will not be positive definite with respect to, say, the Klein-Gordon or some other suitable norms. That is, that is true, yes. I, I see. So, 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 so can, you, can you also tell us how you build the out states? Is, is it yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to that. L let, let me maybe so just. So, uh, or maybe like L minus 1 dagger is what? I'm also going to get to that. OK, so is it so the usual thing? You, you're, going into, you're going way too fast here. I'm just doing very simple exercises. And no, no, I, I'm just using my knowledge from basic CFT course, where sure, but I was taught that if I want uh, uh, positive norms, then it should be So usually, so OK, so yeah, you, you are jumping like three, three steps ahead. But OK, then let me jump with you. So um, <laughs> here, uh, so this story in, in usual CFT, well, in standard CFTs, where we have radial quantization, will uh, give rise to the discussion of null states, where if you find these primary descendants, you can compute the norm, and you will find that there are zero uh, with the, the norm. Well, that they are orthogonal to all other primaries, including themselves, and so they have zero norm. But this will not be quite so in celestial CFT. But even yeah, without so I talking, what I was complaining about is that just L minus one on H uh, is going to have a negative norm. For for k greater than one, so it's not a null state. Uh, negative h, right? I mean, it's a little different than the norm. Sorry. Yeah. H is a little different than the norm, but but uh, but you're trying no, to say no because that h is if negative? I if I take the norm of l minus one acting on the state h, the yeah. norm of that is is given by l zero, so which is little h, yeah. which is so twice l zero. So. The state <laughs> h, but it's true. I think what you're trying to get at is yes, h is negative. These are non-unitary. Yeah. Answer is yes. Yeah. Short answer is yes. And uh, so, so, uh, so, so the short answer is yes. And in order to get to that short answer, I had to use the fact that uh, the L minus one dagger is L one. Is, is this what you're using? L let me just get to that here. I'm not, so for the purpose of what I'm saying here, you don't need to talk about norms. We can talk about norms later and there are some uh, subtleties and it's, it will be different in celestial CFT to the ones that you're used to. But here I'm not doing that. I'm just using the action of the global conformal generators because I want to just make the statements when do you have primary descendants and what is the structure of global conformal multiplets. That's the first thing that I want to say. Mm -hmm. And then in five minutes, if you let me continue, then we can talk about norms and we can talk about the subtle difference and what is implied, uh, what kind of conjugation relations are implied by 4D, uh, 4D unitary Lorentz transformations. Uh, as opposed to what we usually have in CFTs that uh, you're probably more familiar with. So yes? Uh, this H is what I wrote here in order for it to be a no, uh, primary sentence. The generic H that we will be having in the celestial CFT can be complex. I, I see, but you still only want to compute a high state of 
here I'm just, so here I'm really just doing 2D conformal multiplets. Then that there's many things that we can discuss. We can discuss uh, highest weight representation, or we can discuss other representations which are not highest weight. And this will then also be related to the fact that translations do not, um, that translation symmetry is obscured in these spaces and that actually the action of the translation operator will shift the conformal dimensions. And there's a lot to be said about this. But here I'm doing something really simple and I would like to get this point across maybe because that's, that's a simple, un uh, controversial point. And then we can talk about how to reorganize the scattering to either have it uh, look like what you get directly from 4D or to make it look more like uh, the kind of CFDs that you like. But those are questions on top of that. So here maybe I would like to just make the simple, non-controversial statements and then we can discuss about all the subtleties. Okay. Good, so now this is the first condition, then we can, we can repeat the same analysis for uh, the barred versions and we get uh, the same condition now with H bar and with K bar. And then uh, we can also ask um, when both these conditions are satisfied, so this condition and the, the barred version, um, what happens? And then we can actually have a third primary descendant. So we have one here from, from this state, and we have one from that state, but then we can also have one where we have both these actions on the state. So, so this was the first, then D24, so let me say this is maybe the first, this is the second, D242. And then we have also the condition that, uh, so we're looking at the state, L minus one to the K, L bar minus one to the K bar, H, H bar. And that can also be uh, a primary descendant uh, if we have H equals one minus K over two and H bar equals one minus K bar over two, both being satisfied uh, with K and K bar positive numbers. Okay. And now um, I can draw, uh, okay, so we have the following descendancy structure in general. So we start with the state. I want to start with the state now that satisfies both these conditions. So that's one minus K over two, one minus K bar over two. And then I can act in this direction with L minus one to the K and I end up with a descendant that's also a primary. And uh, knowing that one action of L minus one or L bar minus one shifts the weight H and H bar by one. This means that starting from a state that has one minus K over two and one minus K bar over two and acting with L minus one K times, I get, get to a state with, which has one plus K over two, one minus K bar over two, or conversely going this way with L minus one bar to the K bar, I go to a state that has one minus K over two and one plus K bar over two. And then I have, because I started with the condition where both H and H bar uh, satisfy this, I don't only get primary descendants by the action of L bar minus one on the L uh, minus one to the left and to the right, but then I get also another primary descendant by the same action now, uh, well, L minus one to the K here and L bar minus one to the K bar here. And then I end up with a state at the bottom, which has weights one plus K over two and one plus K bar over two. So in general, and this is a very bad drawing because, okay. Okay. So in CFD, I can have either this condition satisfied or the barred version or both. When both are satisfied, I get this nested structure of primary descendants. If only one is satisfied, then I might only get a part of this, uh, part of this diagram. And uh, this uh, diamond kind of structure for the global conformal multiplets here um, will be very useful uh, later in uh, phrasing um, the question of what are all the symmetries, how do they act, where do we find the interesting currents that uh, generate asymptotic symmetries and in order to connect um, back to these interesting word identities that we um, saw in the course of last lecture following from soft theorems. 
At this point, I have not used, have not made use of any norm. I have only talked about the, the global conformal symmetry. Now, if, uh, since you were asking about the norm, um, because in, from the four-dimensional perspective, we would like to have be this, we would like these generators, the boost and rotations to be Hermitian operators so that four-dimensional Lorentz transformations are unitary. And what that implies is uh, a set of uh, conjugation relations which says that L dagger N is minus L bar N and L bar dagger N is minus LN. Um, and this is not what uh, you might be used to uh, from 2D CFT where one uses radial quantization where instead one has the relation that L dagger N is L minus N. Okay, um, so there might be a way to um, get a conjugation relation that looks more like this, um, but that involves a reorganization of the way of how we think about scattering, not just going from scattering of, of uh, that at the past boundary to scattering at that of the, of the future boundary, but a reshuffling of things that is uh, non-local on the celestial sphere. And then in that way you can um, you can uh, mock up a, a conjugation relation that, that looks like this. But what um, follows directly from four-dimensional unitary uh, Lorentz transformations are these. And what this then implies for the structure of primary descendants is precisely that um, when you now compute the norm between uh, a descendants, the primary descendant state and its parent or itself, um, this norm will no longer be zero. And so this, this, descend, this primary descendants in celestial CFT, which have these conjugation relations, will in general not be uh, what one usually calls null uh, in that sense. Um, rather, they will give rise to sort of contact, term, uh, in, uh, contact terms or delta functions uh, when you insert them in amplitudes rather than giving zero. And so in this business, we would like to keep track of these primary descendants and not just say uh, they're zero and uh, that's the end of the day. And we will see that actually these descendants uh, take some interesting uh, form. Okay, so now, are there any questions on that? So just to understand, so, so basically your out state, your out primary state would be annihilated by L1 and L bar 1? Yes. And, and uh, therefore I cannot get any relation of, of your state. Okay, so it's also not quiet. They <laughs> They will, be related, they will be annihilated by L1 and L bar minus one if I uh, have my scattering state, uh, have momentum that's directed at the north pole of the sphere, so W, W bar equals to the point zero, zero. Then uh, all of this uh, just goes through. Um, later, when we discuss um, the Poincaré symmetries of celestial amplitudes, I'll write down um, the action of L0, one and minus one uh, on an operator inserted at the location w, w bar, generic uh, location w, w bar on the celestial sphere. And that would look more interesting. Okay. And uh, continuing with my questions about H, mm -hmm. do, do you have a restriction on the Casimir having to do with the fact that this is uh, the 4D uh, angular momentum? Um, we will have a restriction on the H and H bar from demanding um, well-definedness of certain inner products. And I will discuss this in like few minutes. But maybe I should just emphasize that the understanding of um, the Hilbert space, the quantization condition and all that is still evolving. And so there's still room for. I'm going to write down the norm and then you'll see that uh, there will be one sign for in states and one sign for out states and so it's then not uh, like positive definite in that sense. Andrea, you said something at the end about wanting to keep track of the null states. I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. No, I just meant to say that um, these, these states here, if you mean by null that the norm vanishes, then those are not null, but they're null in a you know, generalized sense if you wish. Um, here, I will just call them primary descendants. There are uh, actual primary, well, there are states here, there are descendants that are actually zero. Um, so 
I wasn't gonna go into too much detail because I understand that Emilio is also giving a, a journal club uh, at some point um, about this general story. Um, and I will anyway also in the rest of the lecture just focus on um, primary descendants that have something to do with, or conformal multiplets that have something to do with asymptotic symmetries. Um, but they're also, and we might discuss more about this in the last lecture. Actually, I, I plan on discussing more about this in the last lecture about uh, these actual uh, zero wave functions. When you're, just, when you're trying to distinguish in this language between null state and primary descendant, you mean you want to focus on states where that's the condition, they're annihilated by the string of generators, but, but, but to talk, we don't want to have to talk about the norms, which is usually what we mean by null state, so let's just keep things separate here. And well, uh, we can talk, talk about the norms. I didn't plan on, uh, but I can... Um, but I mean, that's the distinction you're trying to make. That I'm just making the distinction. And the notion of annihilation are not uh, yeah, used to. Yeah. Tied in the same way we used to, so yeah. let's just... So I've defined what the primary it. descendant is here, okay. and this is what I call it, and then if you then uh, also um, add uh, what you, you know, uh, you introduce a norm uh, into the game, which I, here I haven't done yet, then you can say if it's, it's, if it's zero, if it's something else Thanks. Uh, with another primary state. And here I just want to point out that because these uh, relations following from 4D uh, unitary Lorentz transformations, um, do not give rise to zeros in the in the inner product between um, the primary ascendant and its parent or primary ascendant with itself. So in usual COTT we would have that and that would give rise to zero norm and then you call them null states. And Emilio if you want to add anything to this uh, story. Okay, good. Yes. Oh, sorry, wait, uh, did I write this right? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. If you write what, sorry? Yes. I haven't, uh, I don't know the short answer. I, I can check, or I guess you can check also, but um, yeah, yeah, we can check. Okay, any more questions on, on this? Okay, then what we discussed last time was um, wave functions and operators, so four-dimensional wave functions which I called conformal primary wave functions, which um, are defined uh, on a bulk point, and so they transform uh, or did it, yeah, there are functions of a bulk point uh, and these transform according to uh, Lorentz transformations and then there are also functions of a boundary point which transforms according to the Möbius transformations where AB minus BC equals to one. So that was the condition on the determinant of this matrix M. Um, and they carry uh, various labels, so we defined them to transform as spin S fields under four-dimensional Lorentz transformations um, and as conformal 2D conformal primaries with conformal dimension delta and J under the action of uh, the two-dimensional two global conformal group. And then uh, we discussed where these wave functions, how you could get them from the usual momentum space wave functions. And so here I'm just reviewing the case uh, where we take look at scalars. So in the massless case, uh, a conformal primary wave functions, we obtained it by computing the Mellon transform in the energy uh, of a plane wave that satisfied the, uh, well, the massless wave equation. And this epsilon here introduced as a regulator to make this integral convergent. And that regulator here introduces for me then, uh, or is equivalent to uh, a regulator in the coordinate x, 
where x mu plus minus is the same as x mu plus minus i epsilon, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0. And in terms of Bondi coordinates um, on the future boundary, this would correspond to taking the retarded time coordinate to u plus or minus i epsilon. So shifting it a little bit uh, away from the locus uh, u equals 0, um, so that these wave functions are well defined. OK, so that was just an, an integral over all energies from 0 to infinity, and it introduced um, the conformal dimension delta, uh, which at this point uh, we don't know that's a conformal dimension, but we can then check that this object actually transforms as a conformal primary, and we can then read off from the transformation property that delta is indeed the conformal dimension. Then uh, massive particles are more, a bit more uh, complicated in that respect because uh, they don't reach a point uh, on the celestial sphere um, as in the massless case where really the, the scattering data is the energy and then a point uh, on the night sky. Um, in the massive case, we have these hyperboloids and we have to uh, integrate, smear uh, the uh, massive uh, plane wave over them. So this was given by this um, integral over these hyperbolic uh, uh, slices or Euclidean ABS3 where we have this scalar box to boundary propagator G delta. And essentially uh, here, this is the Fourier co coefficient in this uh, transformation of the massive um, plane wave, which solves the massive Klein-Gordon equation. And the result of that is a bit more complicated. It's given by a modified Bessel function. Um, and it also uh, contains functions of x square, which it can because that's a Lorentz scalar, and then one over q dot x to the delta. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna talk a bit about the spectrum and what the conditions on delta are, what's the range of delta. Okay, so the first point to make is that the usual plane waves are a delta function normalizable basis. So if I take the uh, Klein-Gordon inner product between a wave function e to the plus minus i p dot x and then another plane wave e to the plus minus i p prime dot x, then that result is plus or minus 2, 2 pi to the 3, p0, and then a three-dimensional delta function, p minus p prime. And so these are the brackets that I already used last time. In this instance, by this I mean the Klein-Gordon in a product, which, let me just define it. It's given by minus i times an integral over a Gauchy slice. Let me just take a uh, constant time slice uh, with respect to x0. So x are, again, the Cartesian coordinates. And then this is given by phi um, dx0 phi prime and now with the star and then the same with phi and phi prime star exchanged. Okay, so this last time I got the question what this inner product is, so this is an example of this inner product. Okay, um, the next thing to say is that um, so we transform these plane waves into conformal primary wave functions, but can we also tr get the inverse transform? So let me just do this for the massless case. So um, a plane wave e to the plus minus i omega q dot x minus epsilon omega can be obtained by the inverse Mellin integral, which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity over some parameter lambda where the lambda is just the imaginary part of the delta. So I say this is some number c plus i times some uh, number lambda. And then this is just the conformal primary wave function now with uh, delta equals c plus i lambda. Minus q dot x the c plus i lambda. Um, and this is for omega bigger than zero, c bigger than zero, and lambda can be a real number. And then you ask, well, what is a complete uh, basis of 
at least delta function normalizable wave functions phi. So what you do is you compute. So we now have that the, the plane waves have this inner product and a delta function normalizable. We have the Mellin transformed wave function and uh, the inverse Mellin transform, so we can go back and forth. And now we can also compute the inner product, but now for the conformal primary wave functions. And in doing so, we will find that um, the integrals that you have to solve by essentially taking the Mellin transform of these plane waves are convergent if delta um, lies on the so-called uh, principal or continuous series of the Lorentz group, namely this um, parameter C here is one and the lambda here can be any real number. Okay, so with that, the inner product for the conformal primary wave functions, one plus I lambda and phi prime, where delta prime is one plus I lambda prime, is then given by a delta function so the three-dimensional delta function in p minus p prime, the vectors p minus p prime, uh, now because we go to, uh, first of all, so we parameterize them by omega and um, w and w bar, the points on the sphere and the energy, but now we Mellin transform, so here we have delta instead, and delta is now one plus i lambda, so really the parameter here then is lambda. So this three-dimensional delta function becomes just a delta function in lambda minus lambda prime, and a two-dimensional delta function in W minus W prime. Okay, so we, we, we get the basis of conformal primary wave functions um, phi delta by uh, demanding that delta lies on the principal continuous series of the Lorentz group. So Andrea, here you're just doing scalars, right? Here I'm just doing scalars, but this can be generalized to uh, wave functions with spin. Uh, and then there will be some other factors out front here, and the inner products that you'll use, um, I will write down one for spin two, but uh, a similar looking inner product can be written down for, for spin one, so there are known generalizations for this inner product. Okay, uh, and now for the massive case, I don't know, can people see if I write a little bit here? I will just make two, write two statements here. Um, so here I was looking at the massless case for the question of the basis statements, which gave me this. Okay, so let me maybe also emphasize this here. Massless, and I wrote it for spin zero, but this statement also continues to hold for um, wave functions with spin. And now the massive case is again more complicated. Here, uh, one can use the uh, orthonormality condition that these bulk to boundary propagators satisfy. And in particular, they satisfy it when delta uh, lies on the principal continuous series. But then there's something else, which is that wave functions, massive wave functions with um, delta equals one plus i times, and now I write absolute value of some real number. Those are not independent of wave functions where delta is, one, is given by one minus i times the same uh, number. And so that means that for massive wave functions, for massive scalars, the range of delta is actually only roughly half of the ones for the massless ones. So this lies in one plus i times r plus, or one plus, r, uh, one plus i r minus. Okay, so So this is the restriction on delta if one demands that these wave functions are convergent and we have um, a delta function normalizable basis. All right, are there any questions on this? Okay, so Last time we also briefly talked about um, how these wave functions look like when we have spin. Okay, so let me just, uh, so there's this normalization that one gets if one just transforms the plane wave, which is this I to some, del some power delta and gamma of delta. 
Um, I'm going to drop that now and just write down a scalar conformal primary phi delta, which is just 1 over minus q dot x to the delta. Then um, let me just uh, focus on um, maybe the integer spin. I can get wave functions a delta j. Let's say we focus on positive uh, spin, which here amounts to having particles with positive helicity. These can be obtained by multiplying the scalar wave function with a suitable um, uh, polarization vector. Or if I say some index. And then for spin two, also let me focus on positive helicity. These can be obtained by multiplying by two powers of this uh, polarization vector. And this polarization vector we talked about last time, it's uh, not space-time independent as uh, one usually uh, picks normalization vectors. So this one is given by um, epsilon plus, which is the positive, uh, positive polarization, polarization vector that I used in the first uh, couple of lectures which was given by um, the derivative of um, q mu, which is this null vector. And it was just a, a simple expression in terms of uh, w bar 1 minus i w something. So space time independent. But now um, we shift this by this function um, epsilon plus dotted into x and then multiply it by, um, let's see, q mu divided by minus q dot x. So the reason why we do this is that then, so these guys transform as conformal primaries with spin zero, but um, the, spin in the spin bigger than zero wave functions uh, don't transform as conformal primaries if we just pick these polarization vectors that we would naturally pick, but we have to uh, shift them and then these wave functions that I've written here transform as bona fide conformal primary wave functions. Um, good, okay. So then I have to talk about something else too, which is um, what's called a shadow transform um, because that will appear quite a lot and we have actually already secretly seen it in discussing the word identity for a stress tensor. So we'll come back to that. And what is a shadow transform? So a shadow transform um, is uh, an integral transform um, let's say now in 2D, which takes an operator of dimension delta and takes it to two minus delta, or more general in D dimension, it takes a the dimension to D over two minus delta, where D is now the, the dimension of the CFD, and it flips the spin in 2D. Okay, so let's see. Uh, yeah, let me do this here. So the shadow transform of a uh, field, um, let me say, if I start with a dimension two minus delta, and spin minus j, then the shadow transform of that gives me an operator, or here in that case, a wave function with dimension delta and spin j, and let me denote this operation by a tilde. Okay, so in particular, if I start with a local operator, then the shadow transform, it will involve an integral over the whole of the entire celestial sphere, and I will get a non-local operator on the celestial sphere. Okay, so what does this mean for this wave function that I've written? Well, for the scalar, um, so actually, this, for these four-dimensional bulk uh, wave functions, it's convenient to um, compute the shadow transform in the so-called embedding space formalism, where here the embedding space is our four-dimensional space-time. And then uh, we can deduce how these wave functions transform. And later on, I will also be using just the two-dimensional definition of the shadow transform that many of you are surely used uh, to from, uh, let's say, the, the seminal work of, uh, well, many people, um, yeah, in the two-dimensional CFD literature. So here, for these four-dimensional bulk wave functions, um, a shadow uh, transformed uh, scalar primary with dimension delta takes the form minus x squared to the power delta minus one, multiplying the original wave function. And then this goes through for the spin one and spin two. So uh, they will respectively get um, a power of minus x squared to the delta minus one, and possibly an x plus sine but otherwise um, they have the same form. Okay. Um, here, how, how can you see that the shadow transformed operator is non-local? 
Well, um, okay, so. Uh, like, doesn't it depend a bit on the value of delta? Also? Uh, here, I mean local on the sphere. So if you, uh, okay, so let's say we have, le let me write down the two dimensional um, shadow transform. So we haven't, well, we talked last time about two dimensional operators. Um, and I'm gonna do that also in the next uh, moment, but let me just skip ahead. So if I have an operator, um, which is at point W, W bar, um, or let me start here maybe. Let me start with an operator that has dimensions one minus h, one minus h bar, and is inserted at a pro uh, point w prime, w bar prime. The shadow transform then up to some coefficient here, um, which one chooses, well, okay, let's get to that. Uh, so this is given by uh, d square w prime divided by w minus w prime to the 2h and w bar minus w bar prime to the 2h bar. So this is an integral over the entire um, sphere. And so that's what I mean is you start, if, if that operator is local, then you smearing it over the whole sphere makes it non-local. That's just what I meant. Yeah. Okay. So much about wave functions. So now let's talk about operators and then get to amplitudes. And if there are questions in the meantime, don't be shy. Um, I was offering it while we were talking about this. Um, <laughs> okay. So I would just write down some elementary uh, set of equations here, I guess, um, which is that the, the thing that I wanted to, the point that I wanted to make here was that if you now compute, um, so let's say you start with, let me see what is this. So let me start with a primary, um, well, one is h1, h bar one, and another one that's, h2 and h bar 2. Um, and we pick this one to have h2 is 1 minus k over 2. Um, and then we, so the point that I wanted to make with the, the vanishing or non-vanishing norm is that we now compute the, uh, the norm of this primary, the number 2 primary with the level k descendant of the first primary, so that comes from the action of L minus one to the k, or yeah, in that case. So here I would just compute the norm h1, h bar one of L minus one to the k, um, h bar two, and then ask if that is zero. So that's, that's uh, all that I wanted to, would have said here. And um, the point is that if you use this relation or that relation, you will get a different result. So it will depend on what your quantization condition is for whether this is actually zero or isn't zero. And that's all I wanted to say here. Ah, oh, that was just about this sign here. So you pick the plus. Uh, if you have outgoing wave functions and the minus for incoming ones, and this plus minus is translated into this plus minus. So the computer will be like yes. Okay. Then uh, we can talk about a review on um, the statement about the operators that we made, um, which is that. S sorry. Yes. You done? Okay. Yeah, sorry, so just uh, the, the one last thing about the, the norm. So mm -hmm. you're not requiring that the norm of a uh, primary is bigger than zero. It can be either zero or bigger than zero, but not negative. I did not require. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You did not uh, require it, but are you requiring any of these things? No, so what, uh, so what I use is that, so because we don't know what this CFD is at the end of the yeah. day to whatever kind of bulk theory that we want to, to do, so we are after what is this theory. So we're kind of building bottom up, starting from things we know in the bulk. 
The thing we know in the bulk is, or one thing that we know in the bulk is that we have these uh, inner products and we can compute inner products of wave functions. We can then um, trade these wave functions for the operators and then uh, translate whatever statement about wave functions we can make about operators. And uh, here the statement is just that we have, uh, we don't necessarily have a positive uh, definite inner and product. And this translates to the fact that if you have a primary state HH bar, it might, if you take the norm squared of that, it might be negative or not. Um, Well, you have, yeah, you have to give me a norm and, uh, and tell me what uh, quantization condition to use and then I can make a statement. Yeah, no, with, with the celestial quantization in the box. Like so, that. yeah, I mean, the weights here can even be complex, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, here we made a statement about when do we get a complete, uh, delta function normalizable basis. But um, I would like to emphasize maybe already here that um, the principal series is not uh, everything that we have. And in particular, the analytic continuation to wave functions that have complex delta or uh, say uh, real delta or integer delta will be very important in celestial CFD. And we will in fact see that the analytic continuation is necessary if we want to um, phrase the uh, asymptotic symmetries of four-dimensional space-time in terms of the generate of two-dimensional generators. So this was just a statement about, okay, follow your nose, uh, compute this in a product and see what's complete uh, basis here. Then we can analytically continue from here. And um, I don't want to make any input about things that we usually do in CFD because first of all, we don't know what this CFD is. The boundary of the space-time is very different from uh, ADS. Um, the quantization condition that is naturally implied by the bulk is different from the one that we usually use. So many things are different, so I don't want to impose anything artificially. Now, of course, um, you can try to make things look more normal so that you can use techniques that we usually use. And this has been uh, active uh, uh, study of research and trying to get this quantization condition or make the celestial amplitudes, which I'll define in a moment, uh, look more normal because they are not, they don't quite look as vanilla as uh, correlation function in usual CFDs. Um, yeah, and I also don't want to put in 2D unitarity or these things we would like to have. Uh, so what we have is 4D unitarity. Uh, we have, we wanna see causality and crossing symmetry and all these things, but uh, it's better not to put them in and force them because yeah, we're building this bottom up and so we have to deal with what we get from the bulk. And maybe there's a way to recast things or rearrange the scattering problem, the reorganize things so that they look more normal. But um, yeah, this is uh, uh, what we can try to get at, but it's not what we naturally um, land on. Sorry, Andrea, so, so, so usually, I mean, <coughs> if we're uh, having auxiliary field in four dimensions, certainly the state created by acting with auxiliary field on the vacuum has positive norm. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not just a question about the wave function, it's also a question about what the Gaussian manipulation operators and so on are doing. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so, so I'm, I'm happy with your plus minus on, on mm -hmm. whatever, the, uh, the inner product and so on, but th th does the fact that the um, scalar field, the state created by scalar field has positive norm in 4D translate into any Condition yeah, let me write down the action of the operator that creates, the, I mean, the, how the operator creates the state that corresponds to this wave function. So the operator here uh, of spin S, um, delta and J, which depends only on the boundary point because we uh, define it via this inner product which integrates uh, over the bulk coordinate of some uh, space-time operator uh, expanded into modes. Um, with these conformal primary wave functions. And the star here and the minus J just come in because in this Klein Gordon inner product I have a star. And then similarly in the uh, other uh, inner products with spin, I also have a complex conjugation as second component. So that's why the star and the minus sign are here. And that's also why the plus minus of the uh, analytic continuation becomes a minus plus here. Okay. So, um, just to give an example, so we already uh, talked about this last time, but uh, let me just uh, remind you when S equals two, then 
we could uh, expand a spin two bulk field into uh, energy eigenstates, so into plane waves. So k is again, k mu is again the energy and this null vector that points to w w bar on the on the sphere. Um, and so here, this is just the Lorentz invariant measure, zero. And then I have my expansion into polarization tensors, epsilon mu nu, um, with some polarization alpha, which is plus or minus. I have a star here. Annihilation operator A alpha, e to the ik dot x. And the same thing for the emission conjugate. So last time there was a question about um, what, how to think of these operators. Oh, and maybe I should also say, well, that's probably rather clear. So there's this uh, commutation relation between the A's and the A daggers. And um, there was a question last time about the, the operators that we get. So for example, if you take, if you look at this expansion and you take the inner product of this bulk um, operator with a wave function that's just given by epsilon, um, epsilon plus minus, um, and then e to the i k dot x. And because the second component gets star, 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 let me put a star here. Then this just gives me the uh, annihilation operator, and then for the other, uh, he the, the creation operator um, with momentum k, or in other words, with energy omega and uh, dependent on w and w bar. But here, what I would like to do is I would like to take the inner product not with um, my another uh, plane wave, but with conformal primary wave functions. And then this will give me operators that are not uh, uh, operators depending on you know, energy at that point, but half a conformal dimension and the spin under the 2D global conformal group. And then uh, we, can, we can write down states that are created by this operator O. So for um, out states, or for in states, um, that have definite delta and J and are created at this point W, W bar, what I have is I have this operator OS, but now I take the plus because that, that one uh, acts on this uh, state to create the definite delta J state. And I act on the vacuum with that. And then similarly, I get when I act with O, S minus, I get the out state. What index? Yeah. Oh. That plus minus, yeah. That plus minus has to do with that plus minus. And then one sign, so this was the statement last time that on the celestial sphere, there will be regions associated to scry plus and regions associated to scry minus. And then I have operators inserted on the celestial sphere at the point W, W bar, which are inserted either in the region that's uh, uh, the region for scry plus or in the region for scry minus. And that's what this plus minus sign refers to. So we're thinking of one celestial sphere and then gives the label plus or minus depending on whether it's on the, the sphere in the past or in the future boundary. Okay. Yeah, so that's the, that's the prescription. So um, we're adding this additional label. So you could have said, I have two celestial spheres, one of the past and one of the future boundary. But then we also know that in order for the scattering problem to be well-defined, we need to do this antipodal matching. And so now uh, the proposal is that there's one celestial sphere, and then I have regions on the celestial sphere that are associated to scribe last and scribe minus, and that gives me the label for the operator. 
say again how delta and J are related to H and H bar? Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Uh, I mean, in the uh, usual way. Normal, huh? Is there an or, or what do you mean? So that's L naught minus L naught dagger? Yeah, for the J. For, it, for delta. Because I'm using the box relations where there's an extra minus sign compared to the usual. The box relations. OK, yeah. There, there's one combination which gives this and one that gives this. Well, that's important what, I, what I'm trying to get at. So mm -hmm. the Hamiltonian is, is normally, I mean, with L0 plus L0 dagger equals L0 plus L0 bar equals H plus H bar acting in a higher phase state, which is delta. Here there's a minus sign. So does that relation change, or does the definition of what I call the Hamiltonian change? Um. So let's see, L0 uh, for me is in terms of the Lorentz general is G3 minus I K3. Okay, we can go to the paper. One has to be careful and make sure that all the signs are right. But uh, I'm not sure I can now reproduce this off the top of my head where all the signs go. Um, there isn't one, one way to embed this. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure I can just reproduce this now off the top of my head. But we can go through uh, the signs in the paper and see. So J and, so my starting point was that uh, J and K are emission and then those relations should follow and I hope uh, I got the signs right. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we don't have radial quantization here. We, don't, we have this. Right. Right. So, so it, it really is L0 minus L0 dagger? Um, I'm trying to say it that way so as before committing to what's in the box. And then so I, I'm, um, I'm just translating, right? So H plus H bar is because of the box, L0 minus L0 dagger. And then in that language, you can talk about hermeticity and then your, your uh, How about we do this in the break? Like we can go through the details of this algebra in the break. Um, is it really? I'm, I'm harping on this because I feel it's it important. The whole, if you, if you set in stone that you want to be in a vanilla CFD, all of this will be weird to you. I haven't even got I haven't even gotten started on all the weird things that uh, happen here, which I would like uh, you know I can maybe I'll get to and then maybe this will be even worse. I think but part of the issue is that we call it a CFT. But so okay, <laughs> let. <laughs> so so some tr some yeah. Bias so is maybe it would be more appropriate to put quotation name? marks here because we have this conformal yeah. structure, we have global conformal symmetry inherited from Lorentz transformations, and then the question is what is this theory? Right. Now, it could be a CFT that's non-unitary or otherwise weird. It's yeah. still a CFT, yeah. and people study those for mm -hmm. other non-celestial reasons, too. Yeah. I think we're just trying to sort of unpack what this thing is, and when, when you put, like, the relations in the box are different from what we usually understand yes. by a minus sign, that's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess a lot of these questions are just trying to keep relating it to concepts we know to understand exactly which ones apply and which mm -hmm. ones don't whenever we say CFT. Yeah. Sorry, Andrea, just a quick second. So, so in, in, in the 4D picture, I used to have some notion of uh, daggering, so turning in state into out state. Mm -hmm. So I, I, is, is the correct statement that uh, the out state that you wrote is the dagger of the in state that you wrote? I just have to uh, turn OS plus into OS minus? Uh, I think that's right. So, so, okay, so, so very good. So the rules of the game is that my OS plus only are some in states, OS mm -hmm. minus only are some out states, and they're related by the four dimensional um, uh, not addition. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So um, then we can talk about um, what, one uh, 
could call the main protagonist of this program, which is the S matrix in this new basis. Um, I guess. Okay, so now we talked about the 4D wave functions with definite weights. We talked about how we can construct quite explicitly two-dimension operators from them. And now we can do this transformation that takes us from the usual plane wave basis to this new conformal primary basis um, to write down um, the S matrix in that basis. So one of the first, or probably the first equation that I wrote down in the first lecture was that we take uh, the S matrix and we want to recast it into a new basis that makes the conformal uh, symmetry manifest. And this new basis we obtained um, in the massless case by Mellon transforming it in the energy and uh, uh, recovering uh, the conformal um, quantum numbers of the, well, the quantum numbers of the conformal group. So um, maybe for notational purposes, let me also introduce um, AN denoting um, the wave function in the energy momentum basis. So that depends on some energies um, of the particles omega j, wj, w bar j. And then this uh, amplitude I'll call m. Um, and now this depends on the uh, conformal dimensions delta j and also the points wj and w bar j. And then if the particles have spin, there's also um, here helicity label and then here 2D spin label. And now if we have just massless scattering then to go from, the, from one to the other, um, this map is the Mellon transform, but now we have to do it um, for all the external particles. So we have this product from one to n, where we now integrate from zero to infinity of all the energies double omega j. And then the amplitude that we get, this amplitude mn, inherits the transformation properties of the asymptotic states. So when I change, when I do this uh, Möbius transformation for all of the um, um, particles, then this transforms indeed as a correlation function in this CFT. So here I've allowed these amplitudes to have um, spin. And in particular here, the spin is identified with the 40 helicity. Okay, so much so good. So that's the transformation property. And then um, we talked about the principal continuous series. So this transform to go from the S matrix in the energy momentum basis to uh, the S matrix in the boost eigen basis via this Mellon transform of all the particles, uh, energies, um, can be inverted if delta is in a, or can easily be inverted if delta is in a principal series. So we can go back, um, maybe, oh yeah, okay. We can go back and recover the original amplitude by um, the inverse transform which we have already done before, um, where we now go from, uh, in, we integrate over delta j. So that's from one minus i infinity to one plus i infinity if we're on the principal series, where delta is one plus i times an imaginary number. And so the inverse transform then looks like this. But I've also said that the principal series is not all there, there is, and actually um, at the moment, at least the uh, most interesting or most tractable part of the um, of this celestial uh, CFT, um, if you let me call it that way, 
uh, is when the conformal dimension is actually not on a principal series, but in fact ca is uh, on the half integers or integers. And one can analytically continue to uh, access those uh, operators with those weights. Okay. Um, maybe let me say one more thing and then we take a break. Um, which is that, uh, now let me talk about the Poincaré symmetry of these amplitudes. Okay, so now let me, uh, so before I called an operator with labeled it by delta and j, let me now label it by h and h bar. And let me talk about uh, the Lorentz generators here. So, um, it was shown in a nice paper by uh, Steve and Taylor that uh, the Lorentz generators act on operators of H, H bar inserted at this point uh, in this way. So if we are on the North Pole, then we just have H. Uh, L1, or let me start with L minus one which we had used before in the descendancy relation um, is just the derivative with respect to the angular coordinate uh, w and w bar. And then a plus one given by this expression here, which vanishes when we are at the North Pole or pointed towards the North Pole. And now, um, the amplitudes should still respect Lorentz symmetry. So that means for the amplitude that I've defined, uh, for the celestial amplitude that I've defined, it means that if we uh, sum over the action of all the Lorentz generators, um, sum over all the j's of these uh, generators Li, where i goes from minus one, i goes from minus one, zero, and plus one, um, of the celestial amplitudes, and similarly for the BART uh, else, then this has to vanish, okay? So obviously celestial amplitudes should uh, obey still Lorentz symmetry. Then more interesting is the case of translations. So the statement for translations is that um, the sum over all the J's of the Translation generator, act, translation generator P mu acting on the chase uh, particle in this amplitude should vanish. But um, the action of this um, translation generator is uh, rather interesting. So um, let me remind you again that K mu is omega Q mu. And in the momentum basis, the action of the translation generator is to multiply by uh, a factor of k mu. So that means multiply by a factor of the energy. So if you take d mu of uh, e to the i k dot x, you get a factor of k mu. Um, and what this does is um, this extra, an extra power of the energy uh, under the Mellon transform, what does, it, what does it mean? So let me just write down again the Mellon transform. And then if I have an extra power of the energy, then just means, then ju that just means that the um, the conformal dimension here gets shifted. So the action of translations, which is in the momentum basis, multiplication by omega, in the conformal basis becomes, turns into a shift in the conformal dimension. So um, I can maybe um, make a statement that relates back to uh, the word identity for um, BMS symmetry that we found, which involved the super translation current. And in that water density, we saw that uh, the, the charge in the Katsumuri water density was actually the energy. And so if I have, so this means that the OPE in for an operator with uh, energy omega in that basis on a point, defined on a point W, um, was something like omega divided by Z minus W of the operator O omega, W. 
But in the conformal basis under the Mellon transform, this now tr transforms into a statement where the operator has now weights h and h bar. And the OPE, so this extra power of energy um, via this argument here, uh, leads to an OPE that has the h's, so the delta shifted by one, which means the h's are shifted by one half. So h plus one half and h bar plus one half. And what this then implies for the amplitude from this constraint, um, let me maybe write this constraint up here, is a non-trivial constraint on the amplitude. So, so that one was for Lorentz symmetry. Now the one for uh, translation symmetry becomes one where you sum over, over all, um, you sum over amplitudes where each of the uh, operators uh, gets shifted. So delta one, and then you have delta j shifted by one, delta n, and you sum over all of them, and that has to vanish. And that's actually, yeah, uh, a non-trivial constraint that amplitudes have to satisfy, celestial amplitudes have to satisfy. Okay, so I think uh, this is a good moment to take a break before um, talking about um, an infinite enhancement of Poincaré symmetry in the spaces um, in the context of the celestial amplitudes, but also to make connection again to the BMS uh, symmetry that we discussed in the last couple of lectures. For the second part uh, of today's lecture, I want to talk about um, conformally soft symmetries and the relation to BMS or extended or generalized BMS that we talked about in the first uh, three lectures, I guess. And so the first thing um, that I want to remind you of is we talked about soft theorems. And it turns out that there is also an analog in the celestial basis. So um, remember that in a, uh, the usual plane wave basis, amplitudes um, of n particles with an extra, um, let's say, graviton of helicity plus or minus um, satisfied the following factorization uh, theorem. There was a pole in the energy, a universal factor, and then a subleading term that had, uh, was of order one with another universal factor. And then the amplitude without the soft particle. And then their order omega terms. OK, so the first term here was called the Weinberg soft pole. And then the second subleading thing was due to uh, Kajasa and Strominger. Now, if we go from these amplitudes to celestial amplitudes and we integrate over all the energies from very low energies to very high energies, you would think that such factorization theorems would go away because how, how do you make sense of the notion of energy after you integrate it over it? You can't. However, it turns out that when we trade energy for the conformal dimension, there is a statement for celestial amplitudes that we can make um, where the notion of a soft particle with respect to the energy is now replaced by the notion of a conformally soft particle um, with respect to the conformal dimension. So instead of doing a, an expansion in one over the energy and finding that they're universal uh, soft factors, um, what the, uh, this factorization translates to is that certain values of delta uh, will lead to a corresponding factorization theorem for the celestial amplitudes. And one way to see this is by looking at this integral transform with some cutoff. Um, and here I put some number s, which uh, can be minus one for this term or uh, zero for that term or uh, other numbers for the subleading terms. And we look at what this becomes after integrating. So we get this cutoff. And then we get a pole whenever um, delta plus s vanishes. And so above there I was writing s equals minus 1, 0, and then dot, dot, dot for um, possible other terms. And so we see that um, this Weinberg soft pole, um, after a Mellon transform in the, to a celestial amplitude, would translate to a pole 
uh, in delta, where delta equals one. And then similarly, the uh, universal factor that's associated to the order one in the energy term here would translate to S being zero, so it would translate to a statement about a pole at delta equals to zero. And so this then gives rise to factorization theorems for the corresponding celestial amplitudes, and uh, these have been uh, referred to as conformally soft theorems. Um, and so in general, they will arise for values of delta, um, which for uh, amplitudes in, in gauge theory and gravity, where the massless particle whose energy we're taking to zero uh, has integer dimensions, this will be an integer. But then we also have um, soft theorems in supersymmetric theories where um, the particles that we, whose energy we take to zero have half integer spin, and so then we can uh, have delta in the half integers. And so this is different from uh, the place where we find the delta function normalizable basis, which was on the principal series. For the purposes of finding the analog of soft theorems in the conformal basis, um, we have integers or half integers. And so let me write down maybe a table that summarizes um, not all the known soft theorems, but those soft terms that also give rise to asymptotic symmetries, a clear asymptotic symmetry interpretation that we have talked about. So let me just write out this table. Let me a bit. Sorry, Andrea. So for the soft graviton theorem, my Mellin amplitude should have a pole at uh, delta equals minus two, or? No, delta equals one. Why? Because S is minus one here, so it's one over delta minus one, so it's a pole when delta equals one. And the other one is that has a pole at delta equals to zero. Sorry, I'm a bit confused what S is in, uh, in uh No, I just wrote down the, the powers of the energy. Oh, I see. So this S has nothing to do with the spin of anything. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. sorry. I <laughs> there are too few uh, letters in the alphabet. This was a bit better. Uh, good, so let me write down a table um, that summarizes what's going on. Soft pole, and by this I mean energetically. Um, and then we have a celestial current. And then we have here the asymptotic symmetry. Okay, so we just talked about the Weinberg soft pole, where omega um, to the minus one is the pole to look at, and we just went through this exercise that this corresponds to delta equals to one, and we are here. So there's a so we talked about this for uh, gravity, but there's also a similar statement where there's a one of omega pole uh, for spin one. Um, then let me also say for spin two, we also had we just talked about this guy. And um, so in the first lecture, we learned that this leading soft graviton theorem for spin two um, corresponds to, um, or I guess in the third lecture, to um, BMS super translation symmetry. We haven't really talked about uh, gauge theory too much, but there's also a pole there. It also happens at delta equals to one. This is now for spin one. And the corresponding uh, symmetry is a large U1 uh, Katsumuri gauge symmetry. So let me just write a large U1. Um, then in between, we haven't talked about this at all, but there's also um, a soft theorem in supersymmetric uh, theories, which happens when delta equals one half. And uh, the soft theorem is at omega to the minus one half. And this soft theorem uh, has to do with an infinite enhancement of supersymmetry. So let me call it large SUSY. Um, then, so we talked mostly about the Weinberg soft pole in gravity. Now for gravity, there is another pole which we just talked about. It's when omega, uh, when we have an order one term. 
and that corresponds to the conformal dimension being zero, as we just went through. And um, now uh, let me uh, talk about what the reason why, or one reason why I introduced the shadow transform, which is that the, here the shadow transform of a dimension one operator is again a dimension one operator, similarly for the gauge theory case, but the shadow transform of a dimension zero operator is now a dimension two operator. So there's another operator that, that can write, these two are related by a shadow, and uh, let me just say that it has the shadow dimension two, which is two minus delta. Okay, so for here, this would be the same. And then similarly for um, the case of uh, spin three half, I would also have uh, here two minus delta, so there's a dimension three half guy. And the symmetry that's associated um, to spin two for the subliness of graviton theorem, we also know what that is. We, we found that that has to do with super rotations. And we talked about uh, a word identity for a stress tensor that came out from the subleading soft graviton theorem. And stress tensor um, has dimension two. But then there's also this operator that has dimension zero. But these two are related by a shadow transform. And so here we have as the celestial operators, we have the stress tensor. And then related by a shadow transform, so this has dimension two, so that's that guy. And then, um, it, the shadow of the stress tensor is a dimension zero operator. So let me just call uh, this operator T tilde. BMS super translation symmetry here was associated to um, the super translation current. And then what we haven't talked about uh, at all, but um, the large U1 symmetry uh, will be related to a U1 current in the, in, the C in the CFD. And the spin three half large SUSY symmetry will be related to uh, the SUSY current or its shadow. Okay, so that's just enumerating what kind of um, asymptotic symmetries correspond to uh, a particular um, leading or subleading soft theorem of particles with spin S, and what uh, the corresponding conformal dimensions these soft poles correspond to in the conformal basis. And, uh, did you just say that for the super translations, uh, uh, the operator equals its shadow? No, so, so okay, the operator that I'm writing here is not the operator that who, which has these dimensions. Um, we already talked last time about the fact that um, you get the word identity of Fourcourt smoothie symmetry when you take a, de a derivative, so that will be related to a descendant. Here I'm just writing down um, the operators that give the uh, yeah, good looking word, the, the word identity that's associated to this kind of currents. Maybe ask something else. So here I'm listing at, at, vi at which poles happens a soft theorem that has these asymptotic symmetry interpretations. And then here I'm listing the conformal dimensions that these poles correspond to. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna focus again on these last two lines. We're gonna focus on gravity and identify what these operators are given the, the, the technology that we have introduced, constructing um, two-dimensional celestial operators from 40 wave functions and, and seeing when, when they have something to do with uh, asymptotic yeah, symmetry. I, I guess I was just asking in the case of S, S tilde and T, T tilde. Sorry, in the, in the case of what? S and S tilde and T and T tilde, yes. you know that uh, which one corresponds to which operator ah. or its shadow. I was asking J and P, they, oh, out ah, sorry, of the sorry, operator sorry, sorry. and yeah, the yeah, shadow, yeah. which good, one good, good. do they correspond to? Okay, so here there is an operator whose shadow has the same conformal dimensions. Here, there's also an operator whose shadow has the same uh, conformal dimensions, but this is a descendant of that operator, which, which we will see explicitly in a bit. But yeah, there, there is, so, so, okay, let, we were jumping ahead, but that's okay. So uh, let's say for spin one, I wrote down the wave function A delta, um, A delta J, right? J equals plus one, and this was given by M, M phi. And then you also have a tilde of dimension delta. So this is, okay, let me write maybe the shadow of that. So the shadow of this would be something that has two minus delta and uh, j equals minus one. And this will be given now by other polarization vectors that give you a negative spin. And now the shadow transformed phi delta, right? So this would be minus x square 
there's a minus one to minus so this would be this would be one minus delta phi two minus delta so when delta equals to one then this goes away and so um, so the shadow transform of this wave function will be a wave function just with the flipped spin but otherwise the same and in the conform basis you also have such a wave function that has flipped spin which is the, just a the negative felicity analog which is m bar m bar phi delta so and if we now look at the wave function a two minus delta with negative spin then you see that that wave function that has dimension two minus delta and negative spin is the same for delta equals one is the same wave function as uh, the shadow of this wave function at delta equals one. Sorry, really dumb question. Uh, are these gravitons or are they I'm photons? Here I was just talking about uh, spin one. I just said uh, before. And, and the reason that I have two Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, or I could, yeah, this is okay, spin one. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. spin one. But then if you do gravity, then you get this extra m here. Yeah. Okay, so this is clear, right? So we have... Um, sorry. Uh, yes, so... Before you go on, could you please repeat why we have introduced this uh, shadow transform? What is the... So, so the shadow transform is, a, is ubiquitous in 2D CFD. And we have seen in the previous lecture that um, the water density for the subleading soft graviton theorem is an operator. That operator was you know, called stress tensor because of the water density it looks like. And what we now see and uh, in hindsight, the way that I wrote the definition of what this operator was uh, is actually the shadow transform of a dimension zero operator, which then has dimension two. So this is defined as the shadow transform of uh, an operator O that we defined, this O delta J, which has delta equals to zero, and, and I'm gonna get there. So the, the, that's the purpose of introducing the shadow transform is that the stress tensor naturally arises as the shadow transform of some operator with dimension zero. So, so is it correct to say that uh, uh, this Mellin transform would naturally give you a dimension zero for super rotations? You don't like that, but then uh, you, you notice that the shadow transform uh, actually has dimension two, which looks a lot more like a stress tensor, so you like that. Yes. So the pole that you have here, if you Mellin transform, it gives you delta, uh, delta equals zero pole, as we have discussed here. Um, but then you also, so, in hindsight, I guess what one wanted to find was a stress tensor, a 2D stress tensor of 4D gravity, and that is not this object. Instead, it's its shadow transform. So in trying to find a water density for a stress tensor, one naturally lands on the shadow transform. That's just uh, how it arises. And um, that's one reason why I introduced it, but also it's something that uh, you know is part of the CFD uh, machinery, so, uh, it's also another technique that one can introduce in this business. But uh, as we have discussed in the first part, also during the break, uh, shadow transforms or half shadow transforms, which are light transforms, are very useful in recasting some of the uh, more uh, strange looking properties of uh, celestial correlators and, and celestial CFD in general into terms that, into statements that look more familiar from uh, CFDs that we usually deal with. And so it seems useful to exploit uh, that direction and see if we can recast everything in a, in a way that makes it really look like a normal CFD. But that will mean that we have to reorganize uh, uh, how we talk about scattering. And so from the point of view of four dimensions, that might not be uh, as natural. So there's a trade-off. And since these operators have a dimension uh, integer, for example, they don't lie on the principal series, and mm -hmm. so their norm is divergent from before when you define um, the scale uh, of Yeah, so I can also write down the norm for you for general uh, wave functions uh, h delta and h delta prime. Um, they have uh, poles I somewhere. So for spin norm. one, for example, for spin one, uh, you get the normalization factor that has a delta minus one downstairs. So indeed, if you take delta to one, there will be a divergent factor. Um, yeah. Hey Andrea, can I ask again my question since, since, since now you erased the M's that were confusing me? Yes, <laughs> I can also erase the A's and put H's and then we were good. Uh, okay, so, so, so the statement in case of photons is 
that the, the, the statement is that you have we have a basis of wave functions of positive felicity and negative felicity photons. The one with positive felicity are m times phi. The one with negative felicity are m bar times phi. Now I can compute the shadow transform of those. Um, since they're not uh, independent of each other, we don't want to. I mean, we don't want to enlarge the basis, but you can just compute what are the shadow transforms, and then look at the limit where delta equals one, and you find that actually uh, the the shadow transform of one uh, definite spin guy is the wave the wave function without the shadow of the opposite spin guy, because this factor that was introduced from the shadow transform uh, goes to mm -hmm. one. Uh, and can you remind me how the helicities entered in the game of uh, asymptotic uh, symmetries? Like, do I uh, here, right? Plus minus. Whether you, uh, whether the, the I see. So, so, so I get actually twice the uh, Yuan Katz Mundi. Is that right? Um, yes, but uh, but it doesn't seem to give you any new information. Oh, okay, so, so so just to understand, so in the first case, we actually have two operators with dimension delta, yeah, yeah, and two but shadows, but, uh, shadow but the related. shadows are equal yes. to each other. Mm -hmm. So, yes. and uh, and here you also you get two whose shadow is related, and then from these two operators, we can compute the descendant, which is the the super translation current. So, so you have two, and then you take a particular descendant of some combination of these two. And, and sorry, and, and in the case... I was actually going to go through all that in detail. So ah, okay, if okay. we're now spending a lot of time on skipping ahead, then I might not have... Or no, no, it's, it's not ahead, time. it's just that you wrote a table, and then you didn't tell us that there are two of each. So I, I feel very frustrated that... Uh, yeah, because I'm going to write it out in detail. I so it, th there's not a new... Because of this... Um, because minus x squared goes to one in both these cases, there is not a new an additional thing. But but I do have j plus minus. Uh, we can call it j w and j w bar if you wish. Okay. And they will be related by a shadow transform, and then similarly, well, the p's will not be related by a shadow transform, but their parents will be. And I'm gonna. Ah, okay. Draw so that. the helicities are actually related to the w and the w bar. And then it makes so I get. Yes. I, I mean, this I are wrote really two here different s. I wrote to s and not. Uh, J. Okay, and and finally for the stress tensor, so the helicity information enters into. But but now I, I want to double it, right? What do you want to double? Be, be, because in uh, in two D C F T I have uh, both the T and the T bar, so 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 does this information get doubled or not? Um, of, you of dimension two. So, so in a two-dimensional safety, my stress tensor has well, two Well, okay, I could, components. I could, yeah, I could, um, yeah, I could write this, and I could also write this, uh, but uh, not all of the things that I'm writing here is independent, right? Also, the, these two are related by a shadow transform, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but two and of them two. should be independent. Mm -hmm. I see, and and that maps to some. Uh, actually, your your zero has uh, two possible yeah, I'm values, and your two. I'm gonna draw that now. Okay. Okay, so now I've, as an appetizer, <laughs> written out this uh, table. And now what we want to do is we want to identify these operators. So actually, um, these operators, um, in the case of spin 1 and spin 2, and also uh, the subleading spin 2, were actually found before translating the statement of the soft poles into statement of the deltas. And they were found by looking at when do the conformal primary wave functions that are used to define 2D operators become pure gauge, and in particular, a large pure gauge. So we're looking now at conformally soft primaries. And in particular, you can uh, show that if you have a two-dimensional primary operator with dimension delta j inserted at w, w bar, then it creates a shift in the bulk operator OS, let me put a hat, by um, the wave functions with delta J. And if now these, these wave functions, the wave function that you use to define these operators become pure gauge, then these operators will actually correspond to um, asymptotic symmetry generators. Which then produce some shift when you compute these commutators. Um, asymptotic symmetry generators 
when the wave functions that you use to define them, delta js, um, become pure gauge, pure large gauge. OK, so um, let's start with, so I'm going to focus now only on gravity. So the first one is looking at the wave functions that have uh, dimension 1. Um, and then uh, spin, let me focus on the positive felicity ones, mu nu. And ask, uh, well, I already wrote down delta equals 1. So you can show that these wave functions actually reduce to pure gauge. Now let me also put a 1 comma plus 2 here. Um, and you can actually also show that you can write this um, diffeomorphism also as um, two derivatives of some potential. OK, and now uh, the question is, what are these? So in, in a constructing conformal primary wave function, I have in some sense chosen a gauge. And then we can, uh, we can uh, write down explicitly, because we know what these wave functions explicitly are, we can write down uh, what the asymptotics is and um, what the diffeomorphisms is that uh, arise at certain values of the conformal dimension. So in particular, this potential here near um, future null infinity behaves like um, minus 2r times some function. Let me put some w indices here, which will be useful in reading of things later. So that means that if you take the limit uh, to infinity of uh, 1 over r times the zz component of this wave function, then reading off what this is, this corresponds to dz squared of this function f. And here, this function f is explicitly given by, so you can read this off from the large r expansion. It's given by minus 1 over 4, z bar minus w bar, z minus w, 1 over 1 plus cz bar. And this 1 over 1 plus cz bar just comes from the fact that we have the, the rounds. So again, so we have the x coordinates. And now I'm going to retard it only, u, r, cz bar. And I'm having, I'm having a round sphere, so that's why this uh, factor 1 plus z bar appears. And then um, the wave functions were functions of these coordinates, but also the w, w bars. And so that's how these z's and w's appear. And now, if you uh, remember back to the first or second lecture, we found that when you look at the transformation property of uh, super translations, so we had a super translation factor field uh, xi f. And we looked at how it acts on some generic um, data, uh, ZZZ. It has a certain transformation property. In particular, there's an inhomogeneous piece. So there's a term that is just uh, an inhomogeneous shift. And that term was minus 2 DZ squared F. So that was the general transformation property uh, for the inhomogeneous part of uh, vector field xi uh, for super translations. So, sorry, Andrea, can you remind us? So, so uh, the way that this CZZ appeared in the metric, it appears with a factor of the radius? Yeah, this is uh, essentially has the same form as I wrote. 1 over r uh, of some uh, general bulk field uh, h hat zz. Then if you remember from the last or second to last lecture, um, yeah. OK, we identified uh, from the saddle point approximation soft modes that arose from this uh, c hat zz. And uh, in fact, this inhomogeneous term is the shift that is generated by a super translations, or in other words, uh, an insertion of uh, soft uh, graviton in your amplitude. And sorry, this, uh, this conformal primary wave function is pure gauge everywhere or just near the boundary? No, this is, uh, this is pure gauge everywhere, but near the boundary, you can find uh, the form of this vector field xi, which is what I was going to write down next. And, and if, I, if I take different deltas, then uh, they're going to be falling off too fast to give yes. me? Okay. Exactly. So the vector field that generates uh, this uh, inhomogeneous shift, which we found from general asymptotic symmetry analysis of BMS, 
is given by, let me just write down what it looks like at the boundary at scribe plus. It's just given by f times uh, a translation in u. And since f was some arbitrary function as general analysis, it meant that time translations happen at uh, differently at different points in the celestial sphere. And then there are plus dot, dot, dot. And here this was arbitrary. And now here in the conformal basis, we see we have fixed some gauge. We see that we actually recover this uh, transformation, this inhomogeneous shift from the asymptotic behavior of conformal primary wave functions for some particular function f. OK? Um, and now we can write down, um, OK, so this was the general story. But now we see that actually the fall off of this conformal primary metric with dimension 1 takes precisely this form, which is the same form as this shift here. So we identify the delta equals one graviton mode with the, the, the pure super translation mode. So this function f that we extract from the large R expansion is um, the f for super translations. And now we can write down, um, so we have written down in general the charges associated to super translations. Here we can do the same, but we can explicitly construct this starting from um, the conformal primary wave functions and uh, the 2D operators that we have introduced. So let me write down um, from the definition of what these two-dimensional celestial operators are. I want to write down what is the operator that has dimension 1 and spin plus 2. So this was given by the, this definition that I gave you of some bulk operator, which is now a spin two field, is uh, h hat. Um, together with this conformal primary wave function, the specific one. Now, uh, remember that the inner product has a star, a complex conjugation in the second component, which flips the spin. So that's why I'm writing here h1 comma minus 2. But then when I write down what this integral actually is, um, which I'm going to do now, uh, you will find that uh, there's a star in the second component, which turns it back into an h with a plus 2. So OK, do I have an expression somewhere for this? Um, I gave it last time, but maybe let me do it again. So if I have two complex spin two wave functions, h and h prime, then uh, the inner product that I'm using here for spin 2 will be some integral over some Cauchy slice sigma um, of h mu nu um, rho nabla rho h prime star mu nu um, minus 2, so at the same time h mu nu times 2 nabla mu h prime star rho nu. And then the same with uh, minus the h and the h prime star exchange. So this is a spin 2 generalization of the, the Klein-Gordon norm, if you wish. And I've written this assuming that the h's are traceless, traceless metrics. OK, so now I'm going to plug in this, uh, this, inner, this definition for the inner product, plug it in here. I do a mode expansion for my fields here. And I can read off what the corresponding operator is. Once I evaluated this inner product at the future boundary, at future null infinity, this whole thing boils down to an expression uh, as an integral over the celestial sphere. This is just the determinant of the metric on the sphere. And now, because my h mode on near the boundary is dz squared f, and this mode, when I expand it, so there will be a 1 over r component that gives rise to c hat, zz. And then the u derivative, which appears in this inner product, will give me the news and hat zz. And so that's what will appear here in the final expression for the charge. So there is also the news appearing. And then I also get. Um, the same thing for the BART coordinates. So this is the final answer for computing um, the operator with dimension 1 and spin plus 2. And now, uh, if you remember what the charge that we derived in the third lecture or second lecture for super translations is, you will recognize this. This is exactly that, up to an overall uh, normalization factor. So kappa is, again, just a Newton's constant. And so this really is the soft charge for uh, super translation symmetry, where now this arbitrary function is 
the specific function f that I wrote here. Okay. Are there any questions? So, to recap, we identified that there is a conformal primary wave function which becomes pure gauge when delta is taken to one. Then we have looked at the large R behavior of this mode. We found that it can be written in terms of some function f, which we explicitly identified. We can also write out what this vector field xi looks like near the boundary. Um, we find that it looks precisely like the vector field for super translations with the f now given by the special function. And then because uh, this vector field in terms of which this pure gauge conformal primary mode is given um, generates super translations, we have identified the pure gauge mode, the Goldstone mode for the spontaneously broken large super translation symmetry. So H delta equals one um, gives rise to the Goldstone mode for spontaneously broken super translation symmetry. Is it possible to get the operators that correspond to different choices of f? To, con to correspond to different what? Choices of f. Um, so here, in a sense, we have See, what we have demanded a couple of things in, in asking for conformal primary wave functions. We asked for these particular ones um, that they, the 2D spin is the 4D spin, that they satisfy the uh, massless uh, spin S equations of motion, uh, which is linearized Einstein equations here, uh, and we asked them to be conformal primaries. And then uh, that will then translate into a statement about what gauge conditions they satisfy. And then, so we have fixed a lot here. And we, we will only get a particular function, a particular representative here. Is that because of the gauge condition or the conformal primary condition or uh, why? Well, the conformal primary condition is in some sense a gauge condition. It, you've, so the conformal primary wave functions will satisfy harmonic gauge and they will satisfy radial gauge. And... Uh, but, but, but sorry, so... I mean, usually uh, these this Fs, uh, I mean, they leave at infinity and the gauge condition just tells me how I can uh, extend them into the bulk. So it seems funny that you, you, you get, um, that the gauge condition constrains what F is on the boundary. Uh, right? Sorry, I'm not understanding the question. So well, here I, we have- what, what, what I'm saying is, that for example, if you take ADS3, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you have all these conformal symmetries, mm -hmm. infinite conformal symmetries on the boundary. Okay. And then if I impose some gauge condition on the bulk metric, mm -hmm. that's just gonna- uh, Yeah, yeah, so it's here- It's so not a stupid the, gauge condition. In the asymptotic symmetry analysis that we did in the first, uh, first lecture too, we imposed bond the gauge uh, on the metric, right? And then we found that there is uh, an infinity of these functions that uh, can give you super translations. Here what we find is that in the basis of conformal primary, wave, conformal primary wave functions, we find a Goldstone mode for spontaneously broken symmetry. But uh, we still have the, I mean, in some sense, you can still do uh, convolutions on the celestial sphere. So what I'm gonna I, show I, or I make- Sorry, so, so, so my, my question is, uh, was, uh, what is it that's restricting your F? And I thought that the answer was gauge conditions. So I gave you the conformal primary wave function, this one, H, which is, and I, I uh, wrote this in terms of, con uh, of celestial coordinates that make clear that Q is a null vector and so on, that uh, Z is the point on the celestial sphere. And this is an explicit wave function. You can write it down. You can then take the boundary, you can then look at what, how does it look like near the boundary, and you can plug in what delta is to read off what the large R behavior is. And that will give you an explicit function. There's no arbitrary W dependence, it's an explicit function. I, I understand, so, so, so now, but, but, but now I'm thinking that, I mean, I, I should have a, an infinite family of, mm -hmm. of wave functions mm -hmm. that are labeled by the, the, uh, all the possible functions on the, on the sphere, these Fs. And, and I'm asking, uh, is, is there some conformal primary wave function that, that corresponds to those? We have found a complete basis of primary wave functions 
Then we analytically continued, and from this, uh, in these basis of wave functions, there is only one that gives you this behavior. It's the one that has delta equals to one, and uh, it's an explicit function. Then you can also look at the opposite helicity mode and so on. But up to that, there will be one uh, particular function. Uh, let, let, me, let me maybe also say this. So in, we didn't really talk too much about it, but when we looked at the water identities of the leading and subleading of graviton theorem in the previous lectures, actually what we have been doing is we have plugged in, in order to see the water identity follow from the soft theorem, we have plugged in a particular function, a particular vector field y, for example. We, there was not much time at the end of last lecture, but the, the stress sensor that I wrote down for you which is the next thing that I was going to write, but maybe there's no time, um, will similarly to here correspond to uh, the soft charge with a particular uh, vector field y. Yeah, and that I was the same but vector field that me, was chosen in, in order to find the word identity. If I were to look at the ADS3 stress tensor or probably at super Yeah, but it, that's, it's different from uh, ads No, but, 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 but I say uh, probably, presumably, when you're going to look at super rotations, you're, you're going to be able to find a soft charge for each one of them. Can I get to that soft charge and write it down, and maybe then you can... Fine, but, but, but I'm, I'm trying to say that it's, it's already different between super translations and super rotations. And What's I different between super translations and super rotations is that you will get one charge that is corresponds to the stress tensor, you get another charge that corresponds to the shadow stress tensor, but they're related by a shadow transform. And, um, but the but I get an, don't I get an infinite number of charges if I no. plug in... Uh, sorry, if I, if I plug in the... the um, the, the generalized. It will be the same story as here. So um, maybe I'll just erase and write on top of that since we are already short in time. So now let me tell you what happens here. So we're looking at delta equals to zero, or we're looking at the h tilde with delta equals to two. And uh, let, let's say we look here at the negative felicity and here at the positive felicity so that I can make the statement about the shadow relation. Then um, we'll have here 0 and minus 2 and 0 and minus 2 and 2 and plus 2 and 2 and plus 2. So there's again a different morphism. Then for the 0 minus 2 component, I will find that this can be written as dz cubed yz. Um, let me put a w bar w bar, which just indicates that this is negative felicity. And then similarly, there is the shadow wave function with dimension 2 and felicity plus 2. And this can also be written as the dz cubed of yz, but with a different helicity. And then, OK, I can leave this. And then we find that um, for, uh, and these vector fields yz are particular ones. So yz w bar w bar, um, there's some number, and then it's um, c. Uh, where is it? C minus W squared over Z bar minus W bar. And then this one with the positive felicity uh, graviton is also some number 1 over Z minus W. So one is meromorphic and the other one isn't. And if you remember back to our discussion of uh, super rotation symmetry, here, this was related to a Verisor symmetry. If we allow for these meromorphic vector fields that uh, lead to a violation of the fall of conditions at, at isolated points on the sphere, if you relax this condition and allow the sphere metric to uh, violate the fall of conditions that uh, the generalization of Bondi, Van der Burg, Metzen, and Sachs is to allow the violation everywhere, then uh, we are no longer having meromorphic vector fields. And in particular, we get. Uh, the whole of DFS2. And so the boundary uh, mode expansion here, so the boundary expansion of these modes uh, is given by an expression that looks uh, very familiar if you remember the transformation, pro the inhomogeneous transformation properties of super rotations, which was u dz, oh, actually, I forgot the u here. 
u dz cubed yz so that we can identify the dimension 2 mode or the dimension, the dimension 2 shadow mode or the dimension 0 mode as um, the Goldstone modes for spontaneously broken super rotation symmetry corresponding either to Virasoro for this vector field or to DFS2 for that vector field. And then we can also write down, we can compute the charge. Now it's more tricky because actually what happens is that the, so this inner product, um, I made some remark uh, how to compute the charge using the covariant phase space formalism while one computes the symplectic structure and this inner product is related to it. So this is, you can also uh, call this a symplectic product if you remove the I and put and remove the, the star here essentially. Uh, and you will find that this actually diverges and in order to make it convergent, you have to um, follow some renormalization procedure. And then if you do that, what you will find is the following. So you will find the, these dimension two and dimension zero modes here uh, appearing um, in this uh, two dimensional operator. Um, and there is also a U here and a U here. And so then what you will find is that the operator of dimension Okay, um, let me do this, let me do it one by one. So the operator of dimension um, two, so which comes from a shadow, let's say, and spin plus two is given by this expression. So this is the soft charge corresponding to Virasoro, diff, uh, to Virasoro super rotation symmetry with this particular vector field. And then for the operator with dimension zero and spin minus two, you get the same, but with the barred vector field. So that is now um, DFS2 instead of Verasoro. And so then that statement becomes super rotation symmetry. And once again, you have one particular um, vector field And, okay, so I'm a bit short on time now. Um, now I wanna just uh, come back to what I have said at the very beginning of the lecture in terms of these conformal multiplets of celestial CFT because they nicely illustrate um, what's going on here. So let me do that can maybe. I, can I ask some question before? Over here, yes. Um, so, so in the case of your, um, um, of the super translations, mm -hmm. Um, so the, um, the corresponding charge even for this particular choice of F is uh, conserved S and you've related it to some particular dimension one operator. Mm -hmm. So um, does this operator have some special property that would translate to the time independence of the corresponding charge? So this operator is exactly the same as the the soft charge for some particular function. So and whatever. And soft charge is uh, time translation invariant. Sure. Right? So but the, so the so F, so if I plug in an arbitrary F or some specific F that doesn't depend on time, it doesn't change the property. Yeah, but I'm asking how do I see it from the point of view of uh, the operator that you wrote, the conformally soft operator. Yeah, let me get to that. So. The leading soft graviton or super translation symmetry. The operators that appear here and give rise to conservation uh, conditions in the 2D um, can be um, represented in terms of these conformal multiplets that I was showing in the beginning. So the conformal multiplet structure, this diamond that I showed you for these nested descendancy relations, um, takes the following form. Okay, so at the left and the right corner, let me start with the right corner. Um, we have this operator that uh, for this particular F that gives rise um, to the soft charge for this particular F. And let me give it another name that's appeared in the literature, namely N. And this was just uh, given by, uh, defined as the uh, operator that you get if you plug in this pure gauge wave function, um, delta equals one and with 
positive spin, but now since I have a star in the inner product, I have to write a negative one. And then similarly over here, you get the same thing, but now for the opposite helicity. Okay. Then the, these lines in this uh, diamond are the L minus ones and L bar minus ones, um, which we identified with derivatives with respect um, to uh, W and W bar. I was asking bar. about the direction of T. So how can I see the direction of what T? So I'm in a, in a Euclidean CFT here. You're talking about the 4D T. I, I, I'm talking about translation along square plus. Okay which I guess doesn't appear in your diagram because no. your diagram uh, has to no. do with L0 and L0 bar. Mm -hmm. so, so how can I see that th this conformally soft operator that you've written is actually time translation invariant in, in the 4D sense? Well, uh, we know that uh, H with the uh, Q soft that generates uh, super translations gives zero. So that was a statement that we made in the previous lectures. about the operator. How do I see it in the yeah, operator? Yeah, but the operator is the same as the charge. Yeah, but I'm asking you how I see it in the operator. I know it's the same as the charge. Uh, so it's, it's the same. So I don't know what, what other... What other you, you've, you've given me some abstract operator with some dimensions. No, no, no. It's not an abstract operator. I've, ta I've told you what the inner product is. I've told you you plug in a uh, spin to bulk field, you mode expand it. And I've told you what precise wave function you have to plug in. Isn't yeah, but now I want a, a pure CFT derivation of the fact that this But you don't know what the CFT is, so I don't know what you're asking of me. I, I thought you, you had some knowledge of how translations, in particular mm -hmm. time translations, uh, act on, on these operators. They were shifting the delta by I don't know what. And I thought that yes, I should have the, the, the um, U translation in 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 uh, uh, along square plus. So the plus. descendant of this, the, the descendant of the operator that I wrote before, which I raised now, in the OPE creates a shift by delta plus one. I, I, so that's is the that result that in thing before. zero or? Sorry. Yeah, I, I'm asking how, how do I write the fact that uh, the Hamiltonian commutes with QS, which is a gravitational way of writing things, uh -huh. in in CFT language, and how can I verify it in terms of the properties of this conformally soft operator? I mean, you can translate this statement, but uh, I can't reproduce it for you now here on the spot. I've made a statement that this operator corresponds to the soft charge for a given uh, vector field. Yeah, but I mm -hmm. I just and I haven't done this, so I cannot tell you. But it's an. A I don't know that people have done that, but it's something you can you can look at. All right. So I'm not sure if I have any time left now. Um, maybe let me just finish saying uh, the thing about the conformal multiplets and how they uh, make the soft charges and the, in particular the super translation current fit into the picture. Um, so actually, this operator that I defined here, um, which is a soft charge, um, can also be um, understood to be written as the following celestial sphere integral. So you have this function f. And then actually, we can understand this function f or the symmetry parameter f as a smearing of an operator, let me call it O soft, which has dimension uh, 3,0, or in terms of weights h and h bar, it has 3 half, 3 half. And this operator sits at the very bottom of this um, conformal multiplet. And um, so this, so another thing that one can say is that super translations, which are descendants of these uh, soft charge operators, sit at uh, the side of this diamond. So they're not uh, primary descendants, but they're just descendants. And we can, okay, we can understand now that the, the soft theorems follow from the insertion of the sop, of soft operators, and by smearing it with some particular function of the sphere, we can get the operators that, uh, whose conformal dimensions 
are those that give you conformance of factorization theorems. So that's the precise statement we can make. And then we can also um, ask what exactly these operators are, and you can compute them. And they will be given, so these are soft operators in the limit where delta goes to 1. Um, then there are some functions of CZ bar. And then from this structure, it should become clear that here we inserted some graviton mode, uh, which has some A's and A daggers, that this uh, descendant here, this primary descendant, which goes with two derivatives, will be actually a primary descendant of these modes. So we'll have something like a creation annihilation operator of some dimension um, delta and spin uh, plus two and minus two. And their descendants will give these operators at the bottom of the diamond. Okay, so we know explicitly what these operators are, and um, one of the points in not conflating uh, narcissists and primary descendants was to be very careful about uh, keeping everything that are not zero wave functions, and in particular we see that there is this uh, multiplet uh, which uh, relates the soft charges to a super translation current whose water density is that of a Katsumudi current to uh, the soft current uh, which is uh, the primary descendant and which in um, correlation functions, so that gives rise to uh, contact interactions. Contact interactions. So this is not uh, zero, but it's, uh, yeah. So this is not a zero, zero operator, as you might have expected. Yes. So that's what uh, here I'm missing. So the next primary that I get is at this point here. And so yeah, there's something interesting up. So if I have something up, then I have this full diamond because I have so an operator here that descends to these guys and then descends further to these guys. Um, these guys are related by a shadow transform. Um, and because in this soft operator, I have positive and negative felicity modes appearing, that reflects the fact that there's some degeneracy in the leading soft terms for, for, different, uh, for opposite helicity. Now, if we repeat the same story for the subleading of the graviton theorem and write down the diamond there, there are actually two diamonds, as we discussed in, uh, over here. Let me just write one of them. So there are, there's one diamond that has these two guys, and then there's another diamond that has these two guys. Uh, so, sorry, Andrea, just, just to understand. Uh, is the fact that this three zero guy is some contact interaction related to just, uh, can I picture it by just taking dump derivative on your function f mm -hmm. and that would produce a delta function? Is this why this is a contact guy? Um, like, uh, can I, I naively remember? just act to w derivatives twice? So I've given you actually the exact expression here, which is this one. Uh, in terms of the wave functions, um, Okay, I'd have to remember uh, what the two derivatives of the wave functions h are. They are again primaries. Um, no, and then never mind. Sorry. Yeah, um, we can we can look at that. We worked this out in great uh, glorious detail. Um, good. So now the diamond for uh, the subleadings of graviton. So we are now subleading. is super rotation symmetry. And at these corners here, we have again primary descendants. Now for these vector fields uh, Y. And this guy actually turns out to be the stress tensor. And this guy, the shadow stress tensor. And here, as you can read off, there are three derivatives involved. And so the bottom operator here, which has dimensions th uh, three and spin one, um, will now involve three derivatives. 
Uh, but there will not be a de degeneracy between positive and negative felicity modes. Only one of them will uh, appear in this expression. So let me just write it. There's some number that I'm not writing. Uh, and this operator is constructed from the dimension uh, delta going to zero limit as a level three descendant. Um, and what else I want to say? Yeah, the other thing that I want to say here is that similarly to before, we can we have an interpretation now for these um, symmetry parameters as being a smearing on the celestial sphere of these soft operators at the bottom. OK. And well, in each of those cases, you can ask, what about the top guy? Now, um, the simplest case here to um, look at is the photon, actually, where this is just side length one. And the top guy is like the free boson. And then you can ask a question, should you include the free boson? It's not really a primary. Some properties are like, uh, it has some properties that are like for primaries. But strictly speaking, it's not uh, part of the, uh, part of the um, system. But nevertheless, you can look at the descendants. The, so if I have, uh, in the photon diamond, I have uh, the boson. I have the W phi, I have the W bar phi, and then I have this conservation equation, the W, the W bar phi being zero. Uh, and these diamonds are a generalization, a higher derivative generalization of this uh, system. And now we don't have D bar, D W, D W bar phi equals to zero, but there is this uh, operator at the bottom, and that's what I meant here. So, so here in the free boson story, you have these currents here. What we have here is some sort of generalized currents. And this would be one, two. It's a level one ascendant defines for me a generalized current starting from this uh, soft dot operator at the bottom of the diamond. OK. Um, so I should stop here. Um, yeah, we have discussed. Uh, from the point of view of the conformal uh, basis, what are the pure diffeomorphism modes that correspond to super translation and super rotation symmetry? Um, we have identified um, the, the conformal dimensions at which there's also a corresponding soft term for the celestial amplitude. Then we have looked at this conformal multiplet structure and found that actually the soft charges um, appear at certain places in this, in this diamond structure, and they descend to a soft operator, um, which uh, can be smeared against to give rise to the soft charges that have been uh, discussed for BMS and uh, extended BMS symmetry in the literature. And uh, we've given a, an explicit construction of these operators in terms of uh, inner products of uh, wave functions um, of, with conformal primary properties. And, uh, and that, I guess, closes the um, asymptotic symmetry analysis in the conformal basis um, for, for gravity. Um, I mentioned that there's a corresponding story for uh, large gauge symmetry and also supersymmetry. Um, there are more soft theorems than the one that are listed in this table here, which do not have uh, a clear asymptotic symmetry interpretation. Um, nevertheless, um, there are conformal soft theorems for certain values of delta. And you can also write down uh, formally operators that would correspond to inserting these wave functions with that spe those special values of delta. And you can write down, um, sort of give a space-time interpretation for um, these most subleading soft theorems, which do not have a clear-cut asymptotic symmetry interpretation. Um, OK, but so let me stop here, and then maybe ask if there are more questions. OK, questions? I guess we're ready for plenty. Uh, I, I had one. <laughs> so on, on this diamond here, mm -hmm. uh, so, so you wanted to put a, a scalar at the top, but your uh, operator over no, here. No, no, this is for the photon. This is was for the photon, not here. So ah. for the photon. But, but is it true that I'm increasing the dimension by one at each step? Yes. So, so in this case, it would have something dimension minus one. So this, guy, so this guy here has dimension uh, 
uh, in this diamond, 1, 2, right? So the top guy would have uh, minus 1, 0. And if you remember back, the generalized conformal primary metric that no, was no, related no, uh, to. You're going only in one direction, right? No, but I wrote the delta and j. Ah. Not h and h bar. Ah, sorry. Good. I'm sorry. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes good. it's more convenient to. OK, good. This is what delta and j. So that's why I said here the weights are 3 half, 3 half. I see. OK. Thanks. Yeah. And this guy had the same weights as the Aquabox sector shock wave that we talked about. Sorry? Th this, this guy here at the top uh, has the same weights as, I'm not saying it is the Aquabox sector shock wave. I'm just saying that we had a okay. existing physical metric solution, which you can write as a generalized conformal primary wave function that has these weights. And it's not in this diamond, it's in a different diamond if you wish, but uh, yeah, the examples of this object uh, with these weights. Okay, if uh, there are no more questions, let's thank... Uh